This is our Sunday School lesson for March 13th, 2016. It is out of Unit 1, titled, Test of Faith, out of our Standard Lesson Commentary Manual. Uh, this is Lesson 2, and it is entitled, Simple Faith. Our devotional reading is out of Galatians, the 5th chapter, verses 1 through 13. Our background scripture is Mark, the 10th chapter, verses 17 through 31. And our background scripture is also our printed passage, the same Mark, the 10th chapter, verses 17 through 31 and our key verse is Mark 10 verse 21. Our lesson is centered around the simple faith and the aim of the lesson is to describe the key elements in the interaction between Jesus the rich man, and Jesus' disciples, and to explain to what extent Jesus' command to the rich man applies to disciples today. And then if we are able to identify one area of over-reliance on self and write a prayer of confession. Our lesson today is centered around a topic which is probably as old as the flaws of humanity themselves, but it is key and quite significant, especially in the day and time in which we are living, because it touches on a topic that has become uh, quite essential uh, to many people throughout the world and especially in our society. This question of wealth, uh, its possession of wealth, the containment of wealth, and how that is viewed uh, through the eyes of Christ as he begins to uh, engage in a conversation with a young man that approached him uh, with the question of trying to receive information on how he could gain or how he could encounter eternal life. And so he approaches uh, Christ and the way he directs uh, his attention in the first uh, verse of our lesson, verse 17. And when he was gone forth into the way, there came one running and kneeled to him and asked him, Good master, what shall I do that I may inherit eternal life. Good master, what shall I do that I may inherit eternal life? Now, many of us think of eternal life as the life that is beyond the present life that we live. Uh, because we know that this life that we are now participating in is not eternal. Uh, this is not our eternal home. This is not our eternal dwelling. Uh, and so therefore when we uh, look at the description eternal life, we think about life beyond this earthly present. Uh, this earthly presence. And but I would like to read just to lift another process in our thinking. 
uh, of how eternal life also another uh, prospect of how it is actually viewed and uh, this commentary uh, lifted another way that possibly at this time uh, people during the time of Christ had another perspective on eternal life. It reads, eternal life is the life that belongs to the new age of blessing that God is establishing. It means a life that experiences all the goodness that God intends for his people. Jesus has come to declare that God is now bringing his promises to fulfillment so that the old era is about to be eclipsed by the new one of God's blessing. And this man wanted to be a part of that. These statements uh, relate somewhat to the teaching that we have uh, heard over the airwaves uh, through uh, TV programs, radio broadcasts, talk shows, and what have you, where we've entered this season, <laughs> where we begin to describe God as as though God is a ATM and you can stop by, swipe your card, and get what you want. That uh, this is uh, your season, uh, your blessing is uh, just around the corner, um, that uh, God wants everyone to prosper. And um, when we uh, think of these statements that are made, uh, too often they are always in association with things. The only way that we recognize and realize that God is, is by how many things we have. Uh, the more tangible things that we possess, uh, this has unfortunately become an example of how we equate that God is pleased or that God is blessing. Because look at all the things I have. But as we get further into the lesson, we will recognize that uh, this thing orientation that many of us have adopted, uh, this is not some type of prerequisite that God uses to display his blessings among his people. But uh, for this young man, uh, he asked Christ the question, what must I do? And he is in, he's sincere. Uh, we must give him that. And sometimes when we are seeking something, a lot of times we do display an attitude of sincerity. Uh, but we will recognize that as sincere as he was at the onset, of his request to Christ. That sincerity quickly turned to sorrow and grief once he realized what he was truly asking for. So the lesson goes on. First, Christ does something that is very uh, significant. He says, Why callest thou me good? There is none good but one, and that is God. And uh, that is a very powerful response because I would imagine that if he had made that same statement to some of the chief priests of that day or some of the Pharisees or the Sadducees or some of the rabbis that they would have not responded to him uh, with such a uh, response as why callest thou me good? But Christ right away wants him to recognize that 
whatever the sensation or the attribute of the principle is, it is of God. Therefore, the reverence, the recognition, uh, whatever attention is paid to a certain characteristic that is displayed, that is of good nature, it is from the Creator who actually place those attributes and those characteristics in us that they would be acted out so that people would see his good works in us and then be drawn to him. So first, Christ wants to acknowledge to him that don't call me good. There is only one that is good and that is God. So take your focus off of me and place your focus where it belongs. And then he proposes uh, the questions unto the young man. And he says, you know the commandments. And he recites those to him. And then the young man responds to him by saying that, uh, Master, all these I have observed since my youth. Um, but this leads us into uh, sometimes the uh, flaws of human nature, where we begin to associate that because we have accomplished or because we practice uh, certain things that really don't put a strain on us. Uh, some of the things that we verbally are willing and ready to declare are the things that don't really test us. They're the things that uh, they are comfortable for us to actually do. But there are other parts of our faith that require more discipline. It requires more of a sacrifice. It requires more of a less of us, more of Christ type of reaction. And we don't always readily display those. We don't verbally say, I do this or I do that. Uh, because those things are many times more challenging on us. But the things that are, don't stress me out, the things that don't require me to really have to uh, sacrifice or I really have to dig deep within myself and try and control certain uh, thoughts and certain processes uh, that hinder me from pleasing God. <laughs> Those things I don't readily display. I don't easily discuss and talk about those things. Uh, so here we recognize that after the young man said that, oh, I've done those things since my youth. Uh, I've always been following uh, the practice of our faith. And uh, all of those things you mentioned uh, I, I've done all of those things. Uh, his list has been checked off. And so then Christ proposes to him that there is one thing that you lack. Go thy way and sell whatever you have and give to the poor. And then you will have treasure in heaven. And then come and take up your cross and follow me. And the scripture tells us that he was sad at that saying and he went away grieved for he had great possessions. Many times uh, we see um, people who... Uh, we even have programs now about, uh, and, and this is all the way to another extreme, but uh, we have programs about hoarders. Uh, there are other people 
at another level in our society. They are hoarders as well. Uh, they take the wealth that they have accumulated and uh, they hoard it. Uh, they keep it to themselves. Uh, it becomes the element that truly gives them confidence and security. And they are not easily ready to relinquish that wealth and to share it or ne uh, definitely not to give it away. And because uh, many of them, many of them have uh, looked in their life, in their past, and realized what they did uh, to accomplish it. What did they do to accumulate it? How uh, they actually developed this sum of wealth. And they are not willing to give it to someone when they realize what they did to accumulate it. And such is the case with this young man. Uh, he realizes that his faith is really not in God. His faith is not really um, in the, uh, the security that God offers. His faith is really in his possessions because those things he is certain and sure of, but he is not certain and sure of God. So it is difficult for him to release what he is certain of for that which he has some uncertainties of. Now we want to look at a couple of passages of scripture, uh, one out of the 12th chapter of Luke, and uh, this is a familiar uh, passage of scripture, a man in a crowd approaches Christ and he is concerned about the inheritance and there is some uh, strife or some breach between him and his brother and he approaches Christ as though he is the judge or an arbitrator and Christ said these things to him take heed and beware of covetedness for one's life does not consist in the abundance of things he possesses uh, a lot of times the things we possess uh, break relationships, uh, families uh, fall out and, and no longer communicate because of possessions, uh, because of things that uh, through time we've come in the possession of or we have acquired over time. And then we get into disputes and disagreements and arguments uh, over things. But let's look at how Christ ended uh, this inquiry of this uh, man who approached him about the inheritance uh, that his brother had and he wanted it to be shared equally. Uh, in the 22nd verse of the 12th chapter of Luke. Now, following that statement, everyone is familiar, I will assume, with the parable of the rich fool who God had uh, allowed his crop to be plentiful and, and instead of him uh, trying to see if there was a need uh, since he had plenty for himself, uh, maybe I could be of some assistance to somebody else. And yet he decided to build more barns so he could store uh, the possessions of the field so that he could make more room for it. And then Christ said, thy fool, this night your soul will be required. And then who 
will all these things belong to. So uh, listen to what Christ says after that, though. He says, therefore, I say unto you, don't worry about your life or what you will eat or about your body or what you will put on it, what you will wear. Life is more than food, and the body is more than clothing. Consider the ravens, for they neither sow nor reap, which have neither a storehouse nor a barn, and God feeds them. Of how much more value are you than the birds? And which of you, by worrying, can add one cubic to his statue? Who among us can change uh, our physical being or can change the will of God in our lives by worrying about it? Uh, if you then are not able to do the least, why are you anxious for the rest? Then it goes on to say, if then God so clothed the grass which today is in the field and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, how much more will he clothe you, O oh, you of little faith? Now, the, the lesson is centered around the test of faith. That's our unit. And this is entitled Simple Faith. But uh, real faith is laying everything in the hands of God and being satisfied with what God yields to us. And if we approach God in the right spirit with the correct intentions, then God is eager to bless us. Now, listen to what it says. I'm reading on uh, the 29th. It says, and do not seek what you should eat or what you should drink, nor have an anxious mind. Don't be uh, worrying yourself, getting all stressed out, uh, your nerves are on edge. Uh, some of us have to take medication. We need sedatives because we are just so consumed with the things of the world. But it goes on and it says, For all these things the nations of the world seek after. And your father knows that you need these things. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and all his righteousness. And all these things shall be added to you. So we spend a lot of time getting ourselves all bent out of shape. Uh, because we are uh, just uh, bothered by, oh, I don't know how this. Now, now we are supposed to be good stewards of what God blesses us with as well. We can't live lavishly and waste what God has blessed us with and then turn around and suppose that it is a curse from God. We're being punished. God is not showing me favor. Now, we recognize that God's favor is not shown by accumulation of things, but how well we steward the blessings that he has bestowed upon us. Now let's go further on. Um, there is a question from the disciples. Uh, Christ also answered uh, in the uh, 29th verse. After he astonished his disciples by saying to them. Um, what things are impossible with man. But all things are possible with God. And this was after he described something that appeared uh, to be an impossibility. And that was when he talked about uh, it was easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. And when he displayed that contrast there. Uh, it, it was viewed as though it's, this was an impossibility. But once we look into why Christ described 
this opening and this animal because it was a reality among the people. God always lifts principles and he impregnated his son with his principles. So when Christ would teach, he would lift principles that would be not just for our hearing as we learn through scripture that we are not just to be hearers of the word but doers of the word but it's not just for our hearing but it is for us to recognize the in-depth thinking behind the parable or behind the example that is lifted now it is it does require it does require some maneuvering for the camel to go through the eye of a needle but the eye of a needle was an architectural design it was an opening that was in different passages uh, in different townships and the opening would have an arched uh, heading to the top of the opening but towards the bottom it would narrow down to a thin entrance so in order for the camel to actually pass through the opening oh, and there's a lot to be said about that the requirements of passing through the opening to get to the other side the man was talking about what do I need to do to have or to gain eternal life. It could all be summarized right through this parable of the camel and the eye of a needle. But in order for that camel to pass through, the camel would have to kneel down and those who had loaded the camel would have to remove some of the baggage and take the load off of the camel so that the camel could kneel down and then crawl through the opening. Oh, there's a lot to be learned from that. First of all, those that were with the camel that were traveling, sometimes even in caravans and sometimes singular, but they would have to take the load off. Sometimes we have to take that baggage off of ourselves so that we can remove those things that are weights on us. That hinder us from fulfilling God's purpose in us. The rich man didn't want to remove the weight that was on him because to him, the weight was his wealth. The weight was his, his certainty. The weight was his possessions. These were the things he was certain of, but his real wealth was in God. But God was trying to tell him, in order for you to receive the wealth that I have, you have to remove the weight that you have. So he was trying to get him to recognize you have to come down like the camel had to kneel down. We have to submit. We have to be willing to deny ourselves that we may be fulfilled in God. So he wanted him to recognize that it's difficult, it's a challenge, it requires something of you, you do have to make a sacrifice, but it is not an impossibility. And one of the other things that we learned through the lesson uh, that is lifted as I prepare to close also is, is that uh, we are sometimes perplexed about the requirements of what we must be willing to let go. Peter raised question 
uh, of this to Christ uh, when he mentioned in the 28th verse that uh, lo we have left all and have followed thee we have uh, denounced, we've given up our family members, we've, we've less, left our houses, uh, we've left our, our uh, trades, our skills, we, we stopped uh, what we were doing to follow after you. And one of the things that uh, sometimes in our humanness that uh, occurs is, is that we feel that uh, we're into that uh, give and take. Give and take. All right, I gave this. Or, uh, now I did my part. Now what's your part? Okay, I, I, I gave up something. Now what am I going to get? What, 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 are you, what are you giving me in return? Oh, Lord. <laughs> the scripture says, And the fullness of the earth belongs to the Lord. Not a portion of it. Not, not uh, an area. Not uh, a geographical location, but the fullness, everything that it has, belongs to the Lord. And we are sometimes perplexed about the little things that we have. What the, the, the contrast in this was is that not only if you are willing to forsake that which you have, which is also a blessing of God. But if you are willing to forsake that for the purpose of God, for God's will to be manifest in your life, then not only will you receive those uh, same items, but they would return to you a hundredfold. They would be multiplied. So not only are you going to receive a house and not only are you going to receive relatives and relationships with friends and family members, but it's going to increase. Not that it's going to decrease, but it's going to increase. So as we look at uh, our lesson here, uh, we must uh, recognize that uh, God is not impressed uh, with the things. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, I believe it is in Luke, the uh, 16th chapter. Uh, 16th chapter and the 15th verse. We'll, we'll do uh, Luke 16th chapter 14 and 15. And here Christ again is rebuking greed. And he says, now the Pharisees, who were lovers of money, also heard all these things, and they derided him. They, they treated him with scorn. And it says, and he said to them, you are those who justify yourselves before men, but God knows your heart. For what is highly esteemed among men is an abomination in the sight of God. So as we look at our lesson, uh, the end of it says, and the first shall be last and the last first, meaning in the, the status that we as people place upon other people because of their wealth. We have them uh, in America. Uh, I would hope that this is not worldwide, but unfortunately it appears it may be. But we have class system. You know, we have the first class, rich class, the middle class, the lower class, the underclass, uh, all of this isms that we place on people. And it is not because of the character or the content of the individual. But we do it because of their wealth. And God says that the first, those that you place first, those that you esteemed high because of what they had, those will be last and the last shall be first. God bless you and God keep you is our prayer 
and we hope and pray that something that we've said through our lesson has been a benefit to you and has directed you to become more intrigued with the teachings of Christ that it may change our lives and allow us to be what God wants us to be in this day and time. God bless you.